Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I hope you've had a good lunch. And I hope you've had some coffee so you can stay awake with us now. Because we're going to have a nice lively session for you, uh, for you once again. Uh, again, my name is Christopher Ludwig. Uh, for those of you who weren't with us this morning, I'm the editor of uh, Automotive Logistics. And uh, we're pleased again to have you here in Gagaon. So, so far this morning, we've, we've kind of talked at a high level uh, about the development of the Indian market, about infrastructure issues, and in the second session, we, we talked about centers of excellence with a particular focus on, uh, in that case, on, on ports for finished vehicles, so kind of focusing on exports, if you like. Uh, this session, we're going to turn our attention more, more finely to the supply chain, uh, particularly the inbound, inbound parts and material supply chain. I think so much of the, the, the innovation and the value uh, in automotive today comes from the supply chain. The percentage value of parts that tier suppliers are contributing to vehicles uh, is rising. I've seen figures that stated as high now as 75%, 80 percent, um, and, and only growing. And, and of course, this, with the proliferation of parts, part numbers and varieties uh, and locations uh, across global platforms, this is only making uh, more driving more importance in the supply chain, in logistics, in optimization. And that, of course, holds very true for India uh, when you talk about developing supply chain clusters which can respond to production changes, model designs, new launches quickly and efficiently. And likewise, uh, in a global supply chain where we're connecting, connecting regions and countries across platforms. Um, raising opportunities for things like returnable packaging, for example, or consolidation of parts, milk runs, et cetera. Uh, so all, all of these topics are, are close at hand, and, and we're going to look across some of them with you this afternoon. Very pleased to have a full panel. Uh, nobody impacted by flooding uh, for this panel, so everyone's with us. Uh, we'll have four presentations and then hopefully some room for a lively discussion. So let me just introduce them to you. Uh, we'll hear first from Sandeep. Sandeep Sharma, who's the head of supply chain management for automotive at Continental. Uh, we're also joined by Rajesh Sharma, who's the material planning and logistics director for Hanan Climate Systems. Also pleased to have Laurent Le Mercier, who's a senior VP of global automotive and industrial solutions for CHEP. And certainly, uh, last but certainly not least, uh, we're pleased to have Christopher Tiffany, who's the regional vertical lead for automotive in Asia Pacific for UTI. So if we'd like to invite now Sandeep. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. As I have been asked to present at the most difficult time of the day, so I have kept my presentation very brief, and I have covered only one slide uh, for on collaboration and balance slide on IT-driven supply chains, how we do it in Continental. So if you don't know, uh, I thought that I'll just tell you about Continental. Continental is one of the largest automotive tire one supplier worldwide. And we have uh, presence in 291 locations in 46 countries with a rev global revenue of 34.5 billion euro. So we are present in all across the co continents. In India, we are present in almost uh, all the automotive hubs of the country, but except Sanad, we are present everywhere. I'll straight away go to our supply chain vision, mission, and strategy statements. And our vision statement is to become the benchmark in the automotive supplier industry. And we create this, uh, we build this vision and mission on the basis of five pillars, which are value creation, network and integration, partnership, reliable sustainability, and on continuous improvements. And we build our executional strategies and operational strategies around these five pillars. And if you see that IT-driven supply chain comes under the network and integration and collaboration, what is the topic of today, comes under partnership. So all those topics are very relevant to our supply chain.
I'll come straight away that how we do planning, right from customer orders to uh, material planning to shipments to uh, different customers. Everything we do in SAP and APO. If you see on the right hand side, the yellow uh, colored bars are, uh, we have 18 months of rolling forecast from our customers and then we make adapted customer call-offs. And then from adapted customer call-offs, you might want to ask that what is adapted customer call-offs? When we do this 18 months of rolling forecast from our customers, many of the customers, we don't get the forecast. So these forecasts, we keep on getting from their portals or number of times through Excel sheets. And then on regular basis, our customer logistics team members uh, update those forecasts in adapted customer call-offs, which is called in short term, ACO. And from ACO, it goes to production scheduling and sequencing. And here, plant capacities are taken care of, and then every week, MRP run happens in SAP R3. From here, the MRP runs happen, and the external demands to our suppliers goes when the bomb get uh, exploded. All the demands and material planning happens in, uh, through MRP. This is how we do. So uh, here I would like to say that why we need to do ECHO because as I mentioned earlier also that number of times we don't get the right demands and we uh, are missing customer data. So to make sure that our production sequencing and production scheduling and right schedules go to our uh, suppliers, we uh, adapt these customer demands and on the basis of uh, rolling forecast for immediate three months horizon period, we correct this. That is how we plan. And if you see in the end what the benefit we get, we get benefit on all. First, we get the benefit in the operational uh, short term basis, which are we are able to meet our customer demands in, uh, in the immediate months or next two months. Then on the mid term basis, we plan for operational forecasting where we do complete operational planning, machine planning, manpower and headcount planning. And on the strategic front, we uh, on the uh, you know long term uh, rolling customer demands on 18 months we block our uh, suppliers capacities by doing that and we also take our budgetary figures from those uh, 18 months rolling forecast that is how the complete planning cycle gets driven through it in our organization So uh, here I would like to uh, explain to you one or two also new methodologies which we have adapted a uh, few months back that we were facing the problem, very operational level issue, that when we ship to our customers, our customers were not aware that, uh, you know, uh, which goods get shipped. And so we implemented this solution through SAP only, and we made sure that all our customers demand, as soon as the invoice gets generated in SAP, immediately automated mail gets transferred to our customers. So by doing this, we saved our man hour cost and of course, a no, lot of non-value added activities which we could reduce. And every morning, our customers can see in his mailbox which shipments have come, what is the LR number, and what is the against his monthly plan, what has been shipped, what is pending. So that is how we automated the entire system. Similarly, on our supplier fronts, we are going to implement the MAT solution. It is a worldwide uh, MAT label, which will give us complete trans, uh, traceability for all our parts, because most of the parts which we manufacture are mechanical as well as electronics. So by doing this, we will have complete uh, traceability of all our suppliers who supply sometimes microcontrollers, PCBs. So complete trans traceability will be there when we implement this MAT label. So as I mentioned earlier, by doing this, we, we get the benefit in terms of cost, we get the benefits in terms of quality, we get the benefits in terms of time. So I would not like to go uh, further deep, 
but yes, definitely in terms of cost, we are able to maintain the right inventories and we are able to serve our customer at the right time and we are able to reduce a lot of premium freights and uh, process related costs which otherwise we could have incurred. Uh, because uh, nowadays the complete planning cannot be done on Excel sheet uh, basis. It is completely bomb gets exported in MRP and that is how the complete planning is done. So similarly in terms of quality and a lot of time gets also saved. And in the end we get a lot of delighted, I have particularly mentioned our Indian customers. So we supply almost to every OEM here in India. And here in the last slide, which I thought that uh, I would like to define the collaboration between Tire 1, OEM, and if you see particularly as the relationship between Tire 1 and OEMs are strong, but somehow in India we definitely fe face the problem of having Tire 2 visibility. And Tire 2 supplier base is not as strong as it should have been. So therefore, collaboration comes very handy if we understand the complete supply chain and we are able to have the best possible solution for our customers. What I feel that if we have to have evolved and define our long-term common goals to have win-win partnership across the entire value chain. This is the first thing which if we need to work together, we need to define. The second point, which I would say that improved supply chain planning in the entire chain to address huge demand volatility. In Indian automotive industry, yes, there is a huge demand chain variances and volatility. And sometimes we supply traded goods, sometimes we supply manufactured goods. So if there is a complete transparency between a customer and its supplier, we can uh, have lean inventory management across the supply chain. So I would also say that it comes very handy, collaboration and deverage suppliers' technical expertise to shorten the new product development cycle times. It is worldwide known uh, figures that all your product costs get attributed at the starting of the project or new product development. So if we build that collaboration right in the early days, uh, all partners in the chain can leverage that benefit. Similarly, we need to collaborate to have optimized costs for new uh, product development. And we must have common goal to manage risk management strategies and processes. So in the last, I would say that it is not you and me, it is us together we need to collaborate and together with our customers and together with our suppliers, we can build a visible, responsible, and flexible supply chain together. Thank you. Thank you, Sandeep. I think some strong messages there, uh, very positive ones as well and uh, some good examples of, of some optimization programs uh, certainly happening at Continental. Uh, next up, we'll hear from another tier supplier, Raja Sharma from Hanan Climate Systems. Yeah, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I am Rajesh, and uh, I am basically representing this uh, Hanan Systems now. Earlier, it was a Vistian group then Hala Climate and now Hanan. Uh, majorly my presentation uh, will cover the excellence portion in supply chain, uh, what we have done in our plant and uh, uh, a small, small toolkits and what philosophy we are uh, taking away uh, for doing this. So, broad level agenda. I think uh, challenges in, uh, in uh, car market has already been explained in earlier sessions. I think uh, that has been uh, uh, agenda of the first session. Then what is expected from supply chain? What are the challenges there? And what excellence model we have adopted to overcome these things? And what exactly is excellence in supply chain? And what is the way forward? So these are the few uh, topics which we have covered. So. This basically figure has already been shared in earlier uh, presentations also. 
so basically uh, growing car market is throwing challenges to uh, 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 car industry and uh, the model life cycles are decreasing. There are changes at a very short span of time. Warranty requirements and other models are becoming stringent. Then capital investment requirements are increasing. Fuel rates and other costs are going up. And competition for uh, winning new business is becoming more and more tough from OEM. So this is basically a challenge for a tier one which OEM company is basically throwing. Now what is expected from supply chain? So with new launch and addition of new products, there are certain challenges uh, which is related to KPI, quality, cost and deliveries. And uh, uh, our supply chain is facing these questions. How to drive corporate performance? How to tie ourselves with balance sheets, income statements and financial ratios? Because stocks, fleets, duties has a big role to play in these things improve supply chain planning to address variation of demand and improve time to market or time to end customer how to look end to end how to capture real time data how to test the systems and tools we are already using and how to improve understanding and competency of execution team of supply chain because they are the base and how to trigger green supply chain mindset. So with all these thoughts in our mind, we have basically uh, adopted single mod uh, Shingo model. Sorry, uh, these are the few challenges which we have already explained. So challenges are basically on demand side, plant operation side, and supplier side. So broadly, demand side challenges are basically planning, scheduling, complexity, on-time delivery. Plant operation side, basically uh, inefficient working, real-time data not available. Then supplier side, if you see more follow-ups, line disruptions, and uh, premium frits. So these are the few challenges uh, which, which uh, tier one supply chain is facing. Now, how to overcome this uh, basically issue? Uh, what uh, basically Hanen or Hala Vistion has adopted in uh, 2011 is basically Singo uh, model, Singo model for excellence. So, <coughs> Singo model of excellence basically works on this three concepts, principal values, thinking, beliefs and behaviors, ultimately it leads to culture. So. Principal and values guide our thinking, which in turn uh, guides behavior to define that culture. So if you see culture, so I am uh, putting more emphasis on culture. Reason being that culture is something which is built over a period of time. And it has mainly uh, three elements. One is values. So when we start demonstrating some values, so we had started uh, demonstrating some culture. So based upon the value, what we demonstrate, our beliefs are formed. And based upon our belief, our behavior is formed and once we demonstrate this behavior over a period of time, so that becomes our culture. So culture is basically important to drive excellence in any organization. That's why this is basically the agenda. Now once we see uh, this uh, culture concept, so Shingo model is the one model which we have taken along in 2011 to, towards our excellence journey. So it talks about mainly principal systems and tools and the center is there is, in center there is a culture and there are certain uh, guiding principle which drive these ultimately leading to result. To more understand what as a system or as a tool is, so there is an uh, example of 5S. So 5S is as a system and the subsystem is basically uh, sorting activity and the red tag is being used is you is termed as a tool so this is how we term system subsystem and tool now we have adopted opex mindset in supply chain and we have adopted lean to eliminate waste in our process and do improvements we have developed a lot of internal toolkits 
which have improved our performance on day-to-day -day basis. So few toolkits were basically IT-driven solution, which are helpful for planning and inventory management. Few tool toolkits are addressing packaging and space concerns. And few toolkits are basically improving efficiency of our day-to-day -day work. So lean uh, uh, philosophy uh, was being adopted and we have started VSM. And VSM is basically value stream mapping. So where, where in uh, the entire stream is mapped for current state, then there are improvement, uh, continuous improvement projects wherever there are bottlenecks. And there is a future state value stream mapping. So once you do value stream mapping for current state and the future state, so it will throw lean projects. For supply chain, inventory reduction, pool system, and this space, these are the areas where we can have these lean projects. So with VSM approach, we have identified improvements and completed those with forming quality circles in our plant. So we have formed quality circle on space. We have around 500 square meters space in, is being saved. Quality circle was also uh, formed on packaging and completed packaging uh, area also. One quality circle we have initiated on uh, data accuracy in our ERP system. Now, there are certain more projects on reducing lead time, improving value added time, reducing inventory, reuse of material. So overall, a cost saving of around 80 lakhs is being done this year. And several focus Kaizen was there by ECRS approach, eliminate, combine, reuse, and simplify. So they are, they are basically on uh, product flow improvement. There are certain kitting exercise being done, supermarket concept is being implemented, pool systems are being uh, implemented, and visual improvements are being done. So that was, that was the result of basically uh, Shingo mindset and uh, lean focus. I will not go to the example slide. So once we talk about toolkit, so toolkit is being divided into three categories. One is demand intelligence tool toolkit, so demand intel intelligent tools toolkit consists of, like we have implemented e-Kanban, where uh, entire Hijunka is there, and the complete planning is taken care by uh, the software. There is no relation to uh, daily demand of the customer. <clears throat> then there is a barcode implemented on our, in our all uh, dunnages, uh, trolleys, wherein we can reconcile uh, the material, uh, the uh, trolleys or dunnages at any point of time, and we have uh, this uh, part mixing poka yoke. Then certain uh, toolkits are being dry, uh, uh, made for basically drivers, driver token system, driver rating system, vehicle health chart, and logistic MIS. So these are the few toolkits uh, which are being done on demand sides to cater the customer. Now for doing improvement into plant operations, so various tracker tools has been uh, made like centralized MIS system. Anybody can see data at any point of time in the plant at a centralized location. Variable FIFO system where this barcoding is not possible. So how to utilize space better without barcode? PFEP, plan for every part. So at the time of launch, this tool is used wherein the items are being planned for uh, space and infrastructure. Then value stream mapping all I have already talked about. PIX is basically Packaging information collection system. So it is a centralized system wherein all the plants uh, of Hanan system can uh, log in and uh, update data on that. And then they can see the packaging uh, of each and every plant. Then there is a data integrity. This report is basically run to uh, ensure accuracy of the system. System should always give real time and accurate data to make decisions. And over and above, what we have done with these all improvements, we have made one continuous improvement cell, wherein uh, a lot of continuous improvement projects has been identified and completed. Now on supplier side, these are the few toolkits we have uh, made. Like one is basically cluster program, which we have done with Maruti. Then one is pickup calendar, which basically helps in uh, timely movement of shipments from uh, supplier. Now, local supplier delivery rating system, where, wherein performance of supplier is being assessed and then improvement is triggered. Now, there is a Kanban for supplier, wherein excess material inverting can be stopped. And for uh, tracking premium freight, there is a web track ap application which has been developed. So these are the few toolkits which are on supplier side. And 
टू एनश्योर कि दीज टूल किट्स आर वर्किंग वेल देर इज ए लेयर्ड प्रोसेस सिस्टम देर इज ए लेयर प्रोसेस ऑडिट सिस्टम विच इज देयर विच चेक्स वेदर ऑल दीज टूल किट्स आर बींग वर्किंग प्रॉपरली और नॉट सो विथ दिस वी हैव बेसिकली डन इम्प्रूवमेंट इन आवर के पी आई इफ यू सी द इन्वेंटी टन ट्रेंड फ्रॉम टू थाउजेंड ट्वेल्व टू टू थाउजेंड फोर्टीन सो इट इज कॉन्टीन्यूसली इम्प्रूविंग एंड विद दिस इयर एंड वी होप वी विल कीप द सेम बेंच मार्क सप्लायर डिलीवरी रेटिंग वी हैव स्टार्टेड दिस कॉन्सेप्ट इन टू थाउजेंड ट्वेल्व एंड इट इज ऑल्सो कॉन्टीन्यूसली इम्प्रूविंग सो सप्लायर असेसमेंट इज बींग डन ऑन द बेसिस ऑफ डिलीवरी कंप्लायंस एफ जी इन्वेंट्री दे कीप एट देर एंड क्वान्टिटी कंप्लायंस टाइम कंप्लायंस number of incidents of damages so these are the few uh, criteria we in incorporated in supplier delivery rating system if you see the plant downtime status so percentage of available time we monitor uh, this downtime as a kpi so 0.25% to we have uh, moved to 0.1% as of now and we are maintaining that inventory ac accuracy of the uh, 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 system like books versus physical we do four wall every year so there is a drastic improvement in those four walls because the information is always accurate when we do this exercise from these tool kits so this these two slides are the last two slides basically when we adopted shingo uh, model we have worked on systems and tools now the next step is basically working towards behavior so if you see the uh, shingo model at the base it talks about cultural enabler respect for individual then continuous improvement cycle then enterprise alignment and then results so the concept is basically ideal behavior will give you ideal results now behavior of different people will be different like for any given circumstance behavior of associate managers and leaders to a particular problem will be different so how and who will talk about what so the people on the very basic level will talk about talk about tools and techniques he should have adequate uh, tools and techniques managers will work work upon systems they can align and improve system by that and the leaders basically demonstrate and support principles <coughs> and this uh, system basically drive behavior also so more deeply we understand the principle better we can inform our ideal behavior better we have uh, better we can inform ideal behavior better we design our system and better we design our system through ideal behavior better we can result uh, better we can achieve uh, our targets so this is the key concept as of now we are taking as a way forward to this excellence journey so more focus is on behavior side because in last 3 years we have worked upon this uh, systems and tools and now they are in, into a particular uh, uh, particular stage where maturity is there uh, now work up, working upon the people or the behavior uh, is basically uh, a step towards making a good culture so this is basically from my side thank you thank you rajesh i think that that sort of gives a good uh, demonstration of how taking some supply some concepts around excellence and 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 culture can can feed into real operational uh, and planning results so thank you for sharing for sharing that with us uh, our next speaker laurent lemercier is from chap Good afternoon, everybody. I just does it work? Yeah. Does it work like this? Can you hear me well? Yes. All right. Perfect. Um, oops. I can't approach this. Yeah. It's um, before starting the presentation about performance today. I just wanted to share. It's a bit of a special moment for me uh, because whilst I have a very uh, French name, first name and last name, is that my father's French, but actually my mum is Sri Lankan, and um, and my Sri Lankan grandparents. I came from Indian roots and uh, because law is difficult to pronounce for English speaking people they gave me a second middle name that is Mahendra so uh, it makes it a bit special to address an Indian crowd today uh, with my second name and if you find difficulties using the word Laurent to call me 
Call me Mahendra for the next two days. All right. Um, I wanted to share with you today, we spoke this morning about performance. And uh, when we talk about supply chain performance, in general, there is a topic that is rarely addressed, which is around packaging. And that's why today I wanted to, uh, oops, I wanted to uh, start sharing with you the, uh, when you look at supply chain for performance and you ask professionals, uh, what is the biggest waste that affects performance in the supply chain? In general, they come back always with the same answer is shipping error. And shipping error can take uh, two ways. You see the warehouse, you see the illustration with the trucks. I think also in India there's a bit of in-transit damage that can happen from time to time, uh, I do believe. But here, the, the question behind all this, as you can see on the illustrations, is that even in the box, what is the packaging density that you use, especially when you start addressing damage issues when you have in-transit damage like India. However, behind this, what you can see is that the biggest contributor to waste in the whole supply chain is most probably poor packaging. Whether it's, I would say, mismanagement of reusable packaging or one-way packaging, this is probably the one connectivity item that is from end-to-end -end in the supply chain. We spoke this morning about the supply chain being a joint on plan. We spoke about the supply chain being, a, I would say, a, a relevant for many different stakeholders that, in general, never share total cost of ownership approach altogether. So if you look at what makes the connectivity between all of them, it's the packaging. The packaging has different types because of different parts, different size, greasy, not greasy, line side, kitting, etc. So you see all the boxes that you see here. If you summarize the containers, and they are not all the containers here, there's a lot of diversity in the product packaging solution being offered on the top of uh, one-way packaging. Then if you look at a, at a global supply chain, I would say a long-haul supply chain, just for the example, you see here a lot of different examples of the different stakeholders that will be involved. You have the international supply chain, you have the short sea shipment, you have the air freight for premium freight for those that like that, and there is the domestic bulk, which is, in general, receiving one-way packaging, transforming it in reusable packaging, so that you can have just-in-time performance against customer requirement. So if you combine lots of different packaging, lots of different uh, process in the supply chain, then you look at the packaging costs. And packaging costs, all the studies demonstrate that today represent 2% of the total cost of components. So here you have a number of $260 in the US. If you look at India, it's most probably around $80, $90. At the end of the day, with a bit more 3 million cars produced every year, it's a big number. It's a very big number. And today, our conviction is that it's not looked at in a way that it's a big number so that we can optimize it. So let me introduce you to a friend called Tim Wood. Uh, Tim Wood is a process-centric way of looking at supply chains today. As you can see is, when you look at the supply chain, you're thinking about, OK, what is the process that I can improve? So you start with transportation. You then have inventory. Motion, of course, when you do long haul more than short haul. Well, actually, when you look you know, from northern India to southern India, you could call that a long haul. So you could call that domestic business for you. And then in terms of forecasting, is it a pull-pull strategy that you're having? Are you having the right level of inventory so that you never stop the production line, which is the most important thing that you don't want to happen when one of your customers? And then when it comes to overall processing or defects, well, you see the defects. We talk about in transit in India, but the more you handle, the more you, you manage, I would say, one-way packaging, the more you're prone to damage because you're going to touch the product two, three, four times. So Tim Wood somehow, with the acronym that you can see here, has a friend that uh, we, 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 create, we called a chap, Crude Sam. Um, Crude Sam because rather than having a process-centric perspective on the supply chain, we are challenging the fact that today, take a packaging lens to look at your supply chain and, and question yourselves about the performance that comes with it. And let me start with the acronym of the C here. Cost of capital, uh, cash outlay. Here, definitely, whether it's one-way packaging or reusable packaging, you have to have cash being spent, OPEX or CAPEX, your call. However, when you look at this, in general, you see that it's not like a walk in the park when it comes to the performance of the supply chain. Why? Because you always get, uh, I would say, exceptionals, whether it's being foreseen or not from a, a weekly, monthly, or quarterly forecast with your customers, as per the examples that were given minutes ago. So looking at this in more details, there is a cash outlay. Now, when you, when you look at removing uh, and recycling, 
When you have one-way packaging, clearly here is about what do you, how do you deal with waste? What is the control process you have in place in order to make sure that what is happening in the backyard corresponds to what you're paying for? But if you use reusable packaging here, the recycle is, how do you make sure that as soon as a reusable packaging is empty, is being made available to repurpose for the next trip? Which links into the transportation bit, because when you have one-way packaging here, you can challenge the stacking ability of your cardboard versus the stacking ability of the reusable packaging. However, if you use reusable packaging, you don't want to have an empty leg. So you pay nothing. Because at the end of the day, you pay for an empty truck rather than putting your components in it. Damages is a bit the same. It talks a bit to me about packaging density, just to make sure that when you put A-value parts, you have the right packaging density to protect them. Because at the end of the day, if it arrives on time at the right point and you open the box and actually the product is not fit for use, then only you have customer satisfaction issues, but you have also supply chain performance issues that you need to address immediately in order not to stop the supply chain. Looking at excess handling, and by the way, I'm saying that on damage because I talked about in transit packaging issues, so I'm not going to put that one again on, but when you talk about excess handling, imagine a, a shipment arriving into a powertrain assembly line with one-way packaging, wood and cardboard. It's a clean air environment, so you need to decant, Get rid, recycle, remove, but also repack, or in a kitting area, or sideline. At the end of the day, those uh, products for packaging that we, you will be using will probably be your reusable packaging. So why not using it in the first place? Then, if you move to the S for space, for space, <laughs> this is where you have a dichotomy between operations and logistics. Is that operations never want to stop the supply chain and tells logistics, you better organize yourself not to happen. So what happens? More inventory. That is a good thing in order to make sure that you have the right level. But here, managing space is really having the right product at the right time based on the right information given by your customers. And then administration control, two different things here. We're talking about process, technology, and people. So how do you make sure that actually you're managing your, pack your packaging the right way? For reusable packaging, it's, uh, it's really about having the information of empty, available, fit for use. Uh, for one-way packaging here is, is making sure that at the entry point of your production, you have the availability, the availability of the package just to produce what you need to produce on the day. And finally, maintenance. Maintenance for reusable packaging, for sure. But you also have a bit of maintenance when it comes to one-way packaging when it comes to recycling it. So as you can see, the process-centric view on a supply chain is very different when you take a packaging lens. And here, when you look at Tim Wood versus Crude Sam, we can see with many different examples with our customers that actually it has a lot of impact, which is very different in terms of cost drivers. So we took an example with one of our customers for a long haul trip between two different countries. And for a long haul trip in general, the cash outlay means one way packaging because it moves from one country to another country. Um, then it's going to be uh, in general uh, prone to a, a bit more damage for one reason because there is uh, handling that is happening uh, when the right packaging is not in place for the international shipment. Then the cost uh, optimization, where actually it's the longest leg, which is not optimized. Um, and then arriving at the repacking area, you will have a lot of handling in order to make sure that it's ready and fit for use for the assembly line, depending on what you have as a requirement for packaging. You, of course, you need to have space to have your, uh, your containers that are available uh, to receive the, um, the, the, the parts that will, the components that will arrive in the one-way packaging. But you also need to have space for the decanting, the recycling, and the remove, so that you have two areas that are separated. So we have then the recycling issue to deal with and the removal one, as well as making sure that you do the handling on time in order to be able to control then your assets to go to the assembly line. And what is control? Understanding what is available from what is not available so that you can maintain it and send it back to the repacking area. So, based on the supply chain process that is actually pretty standard, as you can see here, when you combine the two for long, long haul uh, uh, trips, it makes a huge difference whether you use reusable or one-way packaging. However, when you use reusable packaging, what you can see is that it is superior to a one-way solution. However, there's still unwanted costs because whilst you still have, I would say, the handling that is appearing, the damage that is improved, the transportation that is optimized, no recycling or remove, and a bit less handling, in the repacking area, 
you will still have to have the administration control in place with the gentleman you see here, just to make sure that people process technology will deliver you the right package at the right place that is empty and fit for use. You will have maintenance for those that need repair, and then the transportation leg back to the repacking area. So here is just one of the many examples that you, you have, but the conclusion all around this is that choosing the right packaging strategy will make a huge difference to the waste you have in your supply chain. I'm not saying that you should have all one-way packaging or reusable. I'm just saying that have you addressed through the packaging lens your strategy around packaging? And I don't think so. I don't think so because when we have examples today, not only in India but everywhere, we do see that um, B parts or, C or A parts are not treated in a way that is optimized against the full supply chain and what is being asked. However, you see the cost drivers on both sides. And you will see, obviously, that the excess handling and the damage is a little less on the other side. But on the other side, you have administration control. But administration control helps to control your cost. So we looked at, uh, with, uh, with, the, with the crude SAM example, at uh, a TCO with one of our customers, things that we do actually very regularly. Is that, in general, when you, you, you talk about reusable packaging, it's a step change against uh, business as usual practices. So in order to drive the transformation within your organization, what we do is that we carry out total cost of ownership. First, to make sure that the solution is fit for your use. Second, to make sure that you understand the values that is being created. And most importantly for us, to create customer satisfaction on the long term. And what we systematically see is that the packaging cost, you could call it a price, a purchase price, is just 20% of the issue. On this case, with a tier one, you can see that transportation in the first place is the most important cost driver, as well as a bit of damage. However, discussing with our customer, the conclusion was for him an eye-opener to, to see that actually he talked always about packaging costs and actually there was a supply chain issue. And here is just one of the many examples that we can share with you on the TCOs that we do on a regular basis. So going back to the initial question about what is the biggest waste in your supply chain today, when you look at the split that you have here on the packaging per vehicle, the only tweak that I will bring for India is that one-way packaging in India is probably more around 50%. Standard packaging is probably a bit more around 23%, and the rest bespoke. However, it doesn't change the point that I'm making here in saying, do you have the right strategy for the components that you have today? And I do strongly believe that in India, if we were to have a bit more reusable packaging to standardized solution, and I, and I insist on the standardization, definitely the supply chain performance will be taken at a high level. Thank you very much. Thanks. OK, thank you very much, Laurent. I think, again, you can pick up some themes through some of our earlier speakers about the importance of viewing the total supply chain about careful analysis and really considering uh, all of your options, regardless of whether, you know, not, not a priori thinking one way or returnable, but, but really trying to understand all the impacts that go into that. And I'm sure if you have any questions for Laurent or Mahindra or for Tim or for Sam, you will be able to pose them in the Q&A uh, session. Our final speaker, uh, it's a pleasure to have Chris Tiffany with us. I think he's spoken with us here in, in China before India and in Detroit, so one of our more global speakers. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Chris Tiffany, and I am the Regional Vertical Lead for Automotive for Asia Pacific for UTI. I was actually uh, pretty inspired by Laurent's speech. I was going to say that my middle name was Maruti Suzuki Tata GM Ford, but uh, I thought maybe that would, uh, nobody would really believe that, so. But this can be audited, though. <laughs> yeah, that's right, you can arrange that. You'll, you'll also probably notice that um, by my accent that Hindi is not my native tongue, uh, but my presentation actually involves a particular word in Hindi uh, that I find uh, really compelling and interesting when uh, talking about supply chain, particularly in the developing world. Um, and that word is Oh, 
That word is jugad. <laughs> now, I was cautioned that uh, because India is a large country and you have different dialects, that maybe the pronunciation in northern India is a little bit different. Maybe it's closer to jugar, uh, but I'll stick with jugad uh, for now. Uh, what, what is jugad? And why am I talking about jugad? Um, actually, the reason is uh, last year uh, at the last automotive conference, I hosted a roundtable um, about exactly this topic because I, I really felt that this topic was, uh, was quite interesting and had a lot of application for what we're doing for automotive supply chain. So what is Jugad? Jugad is an improvised workaround or shortcut which provides an innovative solution or fix to a problem. And there's a book that's been out for a number of years called Jugad Innovation. And it talks about Jugad. But actually, <clears throat> as I was hosting this round table, uh, I found that um, uh, Indian supply chain managers are great philosophers and practitioners of Jugad. And in fact, uh, some of these vignettes and stories about the different Jugads that people had employed in the supply chain were actually quite, quite interesting. And um, although nobody wanted to be quoted on any of it, um, it was uh, quite interesting to hear some of the stories that came back. And I, there were a couple common characteristics of Jugad and why I think that's important to share with you today. But just to highlight a couple of these Jugads, um, they also use this term interchangeably. Um, so for example, you could say, well, that's a, a, a jugad uh, pumping water out of the canal, right, for the farmer in his field. Or uh, this lady on the subway has a, has a pretty interesting jugad using the plunger as a, uh, as a handle on the subway. So what, what are some of these characteristics of jugad in the supply chain? Um, so the first one that, that we noted down is that a jugad is an ad hoc temporary solution that almost always becomes permanent for lack of a better solution. And, uh, and in this example, this is a jugad that actually we employ in one of our operations in Thailand. Um, and uh, if you look closely at that picture, you'll notice that uh, that bench there uh, is actually made out of uh, wooden material from a pallet. And the uh, cushiony part of the bench uh, actually comes from some uh, uh, packaging material that uh, was discarded. So in this case, we're, we're doing one better. We're actually using this um, uh, disposable packaging to, to make a pretty comfortable bench out of this. So that's one example of a jugad. This is a more practical example of, uh, of a jugad. Um, this is a uh, visual control board uh, that we use again for one of our uh, important OEM clients. Uh, and you'll notice that there's really nothing high tech about this board, but it, it employs a, a very uh, simple visual identification system of red, yellow, green. And if you notice there, those are actually washers uh, that are colored red, yellow, and green. So when the container is completed to load, it's green. When it's in the loading process, it's yellow. And when there's a problem or something that needs to be resolved, it's a red washer. Now, we could have invested a lot of money to make this a, a, a great solution with uh, bells and whistles and automation, and, but uh, for our purpose, for this client, uh, this Jugad solution actually does quite well for us. And what's interesting is that this is becoming um, also a best practice in our operation as well. What's, what's another example of a jugad? Um, and, and here I'm, I'm uh, drawing an analogy. I'm saying that um, what, what's the best way to, to get rid of flies or mosquitoes, right? And on the x-axis, uh, you see the concept of effectiveness. So something that, that works very, very well. And on the y-axis, you're seeing the concept of efficiency. Uh, so something that works but is much more efficient. It's sort of like when India uh, beat South Africa in the test series, you walloped them. And that was very effective, but the margin that you beat them by was quite substantial uh, when actually you just need to beat them by one run. 
So that would be uh, an example of uh, maybe low efficiency but great effectiveness, right? Uh, so in this example, um, if, you're, if your goal is to kill the fly, um, you, you've got a couple options. Um, so obviously the, the one on the right is, is overkill. That's very effective, but that's going to create all kinds of negative externalities for you, right? Uh, the, the gun doesn't work. Uh, the bug spray works, but maybe that's not so green and environmentally conscious. Um, now the most efficient way is to reach out and swat the bug, right, with your hand, okay? But that's also uh, probably the messiest way to do it, and, and maybe that's not the best solution either. So the kind of the sweet spot for Jugad is that middle area. Uh, the fly swatter is the perfect tool to swat the fly, uh, but the Jugad tool would actually be the rolled up newspaper, right? Uh, because that's uh, very high efficiency um, with the same effectiveness, and it might even be cheaper than the, than the fly swatter. So just an example there to get you to think about this concept a little bit. How do you apply that to uh, your supply chain? Because uh, that's why we're here. Um, so if you replace effectiveness with the concept of cost, and then you look at the y-axis uh, efficiency as being uh, transit time or days, uh, you, you've got a, a very uh, vast difference between these modes. You've got uh, air freight, uh, if you're shipping uh, internationally, which is uh, definitely high cost, um, but very low transit time. Uh, ocean freight is uh, uh, lower cost, historically low cost, uh, but but quite a long transit time. So that middle area that we're trying to cultivate, again, with the fly swatter and the rolled up newspaper, um, there could be a number of solutions there. It could be a combination of uh, rail, could be rail, barge, truck, sea, air. Uh, there, there could be a lot of uh, potential um, modes that you can insert in there that would be a Jugad solution. Um, so there, there's a sweet spot in there that, as supply chain managers, we always have to keep in mind. Um, and of course, there's trade-offs always that we have to balance between transit time, cost, effectiveness, and complexity. Now, I'm, I'm really in imagination land right here on this one, <laughs> but uh, I, I hope you can bear with me. So as we were talking uh, in our roundtable, um, we realized that sometimes these jugads um, are, there was a debate whether these are really best practices. Do we really want to emulate this idea of the workaround? And, uh, and we had a very spirited debate. Um, what we realized is that a jugad is very unique to a specific problem statement. Uh, and in most cases, uh, these may not be rep replicatable or repeatable because they're hard to predict. Um, and somebody actually coined the term, uh, those aren't jugads, those are googlies. And I, of course, because I'm not uh, a huge cricket fan yet, I said, what's a googly? And somebody said, well, it's like the cricket version of a knuckleball. So it's a, a ball that you would throw uh, that uh, you expect it to spin one way, but it'll spin the other way. And there's always maybe some subterfuge about what somebody is doing to the ball behind. So um, uh, we have to be careful that our jugads <laughs> don't turn into googlies, is the point. So to sum this up, uh, the question is, what are your jugads? What, what are the things that you are doing in your supply chain which are in response to a specific problem uh, that are really born out of necessity uh, that may or may not be best practices and that you may be looking to replicate or you, you may actually be looking not to replicate those. Um, and uh, it was interesting today because uh, you had one speaker, uh, Gautam Day, who was talking about the rat problem in Mumbai port. And it was, it was an amusing kind of anecdote about uh, employing the, the rat catcher. Actually, there's a, a very good uh, Jugad for uh, controlling rats, and that's um, and one of the gentlemen last year uh, shared that it's actually to put cigarettes 
because rats don't like tobacco. So they said uh, as they were shipping vehicles, they actually would, would put cigarettes uh, taped into the vehicle and the rats would smell that and then they decided that, uh, no, I'm not gonna chew at the rubber or the tires and I'm not gonna go after that particular vehicle because it smelled bad. Uh, but then that created an, another issue where sometimes they forgot to take the cigarettes out. So they would ship a vehicle and you would open up the hood and there's a packet of, of cigarettes in there. So, so thank you very much. I appreciate your time to talk about uh, the concept of Jugad and I look forward to some of your questions and comments later. Thank you very much. Thanks, Thanks very much, Chris. Uh, having heard Chris speak a number of times, it usually is a, a cultural journey, so that's always, it's always enjoyable. He's, I've heard him give presentations in Chinese and English, now Hindi. I guess the next one's in Danish, right? So we'll, uh, we'll wait to hear that next year. Um, but uh, obviously, you know, raising some interesting issues there and perhaps being realistic in some ways about aspects of the Indian supply chain. I think uh, riding, riding on a motorway in India, we, we see many versions of a, of a jugad on the road in some ways every, every day, whether it's a, a bicycle loading a haul or, or uses of mules or whatever we, we have. So um, it's just part of the landscape, landscape here. Um, we have some time for questions now. You've had, obviously, presentations from quite different perspectives, but all, all around, uh, in some way or other, supply chain excellence. Um, so if anyone has any thoughts or comments that they'd that they'd like to share. Uh, we have microphones and we, got, we have a question. We'll start right here in the middle. Uh, and the microphone's coming to you. Thank you. Hi, good afternoon. I am Jaipal from Harley Davidson. So I have a comment or question to Rajesh. So yes, culture is a very important thing and it could be a big topic for discussion today. Whenever you go to any OE, OEM, you see that they are taking very good care of their products when they are manufacturing it. And the same culture, every OEM expects their supplier should do and implement it their line and down to their tiers, maybe tier two, tier three. So congratulations that you are working on uh, culture point. But it ignites some thoughts in my mind and I have some qu questions around it. So the, my question to you is, what is the control parameter and what, how you measure that your culture is being improving or it is not improving? How, what actions you implement down to the line, down to the people? And if I go to the last slide which you have shown, you, show, you have shown that different level of people talk different things. Yes, if you improve those different things for different people, are you sure that your culture will upgrade? So what would be the actions you would be taking and how would you measure that your culture is improving now? Okay, thank you uh, for raising this question. Uh, see, uh, this Hanan Climate System is uh, basically a, Shingo medal, a silver medallion company. So uh, Shingo medal is uh, basically given for operation excellence and uh, there is a measurement of culture. When the assessment is done, so a measurement is done on how the culture is there in organization. So the people who are doing this measurement, they directly go to the last denominator of the uh, shop floor. And they ask question, okay, what is your vision? In this case, if, if, if a problem comes, how you will react? So that somewhere they, they try to see what are the thoughts in their mind while giving these answers. So we have an internal assessment also for this culture, wherein a questionnaire has been prepared and a team is there who goes to every level asking questions for different scenarios and based upon the answer given, there is a assessment done and the ranking is given. And based upon those rankings, uh, action plan is being derived. So that's how we are uh, measuring that. Am I, am I able to? Uh... I can't, please. So do you have a index for measuring that? It's kind of a score index or something? Uh, okay. Like if everybody should be aware, means everybody must be aware of engagement scores we have? Correct. 
so like that you have <coughs> some kind of culture or behavioral scores or see it is it is a mix of uh, all these things where in engagement and then uh, competency levels and uh, uh, the results which are there into your uh, kpis so all this makes a particular index okay uh, like out of 5 how much you achieve like suppose a problem is there now for that problem uh, whether there is a system available whether the system is effective whether the person who is associated with the problem knows about the problem whether the seniors to him also uh, takes care of those things so based upon that a marking is given out of 5 and a final number comes out uh, after averaging out all these things and that number is basically uh, the index of that particular uh, line item and based upon that a complete assessment is done okay out of say 100 you have scored 77 67 or 87 and the target is say 85 so you have to improve all in this, all in these areas so that is how it is done and this culture uh, you are talking about it is for your organization only or you are planning it to implement and go down to your tiers also see uh, in initial stage we have worked on systems and tools as a part of this uh, shingo model exercise now uh, we have started this uh, particular culture journey although culture is basically uh, being built over a period of time but the as far as focus is concerned on ideal behavior when a particular situation arises, when there is a conflict so how people will respond to that conflict what is the ideal behavior there should be so uh, that exercise we have started this year only because uh, ideal results will only come when we behave ideally in a particular situation otherwise uh, most of the companies have all systems and tools in place but still uh, results are uh, not there reason being ke a lot of conflict and a lot of issues are there so uh, people are basically engaged uh, to make them uh, engage in, in such a way ke, uh, they feel ke we are the owner of this uh, particular process and how uh, how to take it forward in a, a particular way and how to come to a solution uh, rather than uh, uh, satisfying individual uh, uh, objectives so uh, that that somewhere reflects culture so this journey we have started this year only and uh, uh, I'm sure over a period of time because we are also going for gold in uh, Shingo uh, uh, this uh, uh, applications. So uh, for this, uh, that for that assessment, we have to prepare ourselves that each member of us in our plant uh, should have adequate uh, understanding of what is ideal behavior, how to react in a particular situation and how to resolve conflict, how to make uh, engagements uh, in solving problem. So uh, yes, once we are through, we will definitely take it to tier one. Okay, thank you for that exchange. Um, do we, uh, we have a question right there as well. Good afternoon, I am Jayaprakash from JK Finan India Limited, a tier one supplier to all OEMs. <laughs> My question to Mr. Sandeep Sharma, in your presentation you explained about that uh, integration of information flow from your company to an OEMs. My question is, what are the challenges you faced while integration, the information flow? Have you considered the LSP and then ESN? All the OEMs having ESN, they, once we dispatched, we are going through information to ESN. How you integrated? Then, and the second part, uh, from OEM receiving the material, they're not giving any information in automated. We are giving a customer information to all supplier to OEMs. ASN or mail, we are doing. At the same time, we are expecting from the OEM information and material received. What is the practical problem we are facing? Material received in the store yard. The buyer is not knowing, the transporter saying material received. Uh, the request is that in the forum, I put the information from that OEMs from I am received the material or when we receive the material from that OEMs. The one is two continental, another to the OEMs. Hello. Hello. Yeah, you're on. Hello. Yes. Uh, as you have rightly mentioned, we are facing some problems, uh, and uh, from OEMs, when we ship the material, yes, they do get the complete information, and uh, like from all the concerned buyers of particular OEM get that mail every day uh, in the morning 
number of mails I am marked so I can also see that they get the mails. All the concerned buyers of particular OEM will get the mail that this material has been dispatched from continental India, this, all the LR details, everything is there. But you are right that from their side we don't get uh, the information and how we get the information that we have to go to their portal and get our GRN downloaded from their portal to ensure that yes, whatever goods we had shipped, uh, those goods are received at uh, their warehouse. This is how uh, we do. And what uh, I think your second part was, this was the first part of your question. That linking with the LSPs and the, uh, because every OEM is ASN part. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, coming back to uh, linking with LSP, there is uh, in our organization also, uh, right now we have m ensured that all our vehicles are uh, GRPS fitted. But still in India, we do face problems. I can quote you one example, while our goods were going from uh, Bangalore to Chennai at Kanchipuram in the night, uh, the rear axle of the vehicle got broken. So with great difficulty, even after having the GRPS installed, we could find out that yes, the vehicle has got broken somewhere near the Kanchipuram area. But again, we have to track, uh, we had to talk to the transporter and uh, make him uh, run to that particular site. So we are facing this kind of problem. Another thing which our organization is doing is that now the missing link was even global freight forwarding. All the systems were missing. That is the missing link that when the shipments get shipped from our suppliers to that freight forwarder to customs, that link was totally miss missing. So now globally our organization is implementing a system called TOMS, which will link all global freight forwarders to our SAP systems. And then we will be able to see and track all our consignments from our different suppliers online. This is how we are going to track uh, our suppliers' consignments. Thank you. Any questions, other questions? We have a question right here from the young lady. There's a very old man approaching you with a microphone coming behind you, it's very slow, sorry about that. Hello, my name is Sony and I'm associated with the Continental Manasa plant. Uh, still, I have a question uh, with Lauren. Uh, basically, I am working with CHAP. Uh, you can say that uh, we are finding some uh, good solution for us, last four years. But majorly, what I am thinking about CHAP, you are not uh, linking with major OEM so fast in India. Means uh, you don't have any contract with Hero. And uh, recently, you are going for TVS, where we have two-wheeler business. And uh, if you see, you know, like uh, if I say the car business also, uh, except two, three major uh, customers, you are not having that much volume where you need to customize your packaging according to the product. Means uh, either you need to provide the inserts or uh, you can make like uh, some uh, packaging which you can't fold, basically. So uh, my idea is that so far in uh, working with last three years with you, I am not getting it cost effective. Because of if you ask me, I'll just do that way. If I'll go for non-returnable packaging, what will be the cost? Then if I own my own packaging, what will be the cost? And then if I am using a chap packaging, what will be the cost? People will go with the like leasing packaging when they got some uh, uh, lucrative uh, cost saving and the assurance. With chap so far, uh, I feel there is a, a lot of limitation in India market. So I want to know what you will take action to uh, make your packaging more affordable for the such business where you don't have much volumes. And uh, topic is also there like uh, in India when we are moving our shipments out, uh, then uh, it it's stay basically in customer warehouse uh, sometimes for a long period because your uh, India market is fluctuating like you can't predict. And uh, you are charging on a daily basis uh, packaging cost. So I just really need to know because I want to uh, use CHAP uh, majorly in my plant. But uh, because of this cost effectiveness, I am not able to do that so far. So you had many questions into one. So I'll, I'll try to, uh, <laughs> to answer all of them. First of all, your customer and your satisfaction counts. 
So if you're mentioning this, obviously there are areas that need to be addressed. Okay? Um, now in terms of total cost, uh, fundamentally there is also the qualitative aspect that needs to be taken into consideration. And I'm more than happy with DK Ryan and Chris Perumo, who are in the room, to have this discussion with you because it's important that you feel that value. What we see more specifically in India, we are very gifted to have a very nice list of customers in India, including major OEMs and major tier ones. It is indeed a growing country because we see that there are lots of, I would say, habits or conservative habits that have been taken for many, many years. That is not specific actually to India because we are in a conservative industry. What is true is that today what we see is that you have, let's say, four regions that needs to be interconnected, notably North and South. And uh, we are, because of our strong growth that we're having in India, uh, being able to do more than what we were doing in the past. Now, of course, when I look at the Indian market, uh, we obviously want to be bigger and going forward, and that's why we're innovating in terms of solutions. Solutions being that in India, also like in Asia in general and South Africa, less in Europe and the US, we combine the pooling of crates containers with inserts, which obviously at the end of the day provides you with a full solution that, uh, that is far more effective uh, because obviously when you take the inserts, you're capable to optimize the packaging density and also make sure that you get a standard service on an, on an ongoing basis. So yes, indeed, we started in this country six years ago. Uh, we're enjoying a very strong growth. Uh, there's still a lot for us to do, definitely. And we're more open to, uh, to have more and more, uh, I would say, not customized solution, but uh, uh, developing certain de standards that are required. Now, if specifically for your case, you feel that there's a level of dissatisfaction, I'm more than happy to discuss that with you because at the end of the day, we're here to support your own growth and uh, you're an important T1, so I'm not going to disregard what you're saying here. But uh, again, I think there's a different dynamic. And maybe last point, when you come to, uh, to cost and comparison, it's, uh, I, I think at the end of the day, uh, once it's in usage, people tend to forget what it was before. And I think that if you benchmark and compare and contrast, uh, maybe it's, it's a work that we need to do together again just to, uh, to put it on the table. Because if you don't see the value, I, I would certainly not encourage you to, uh, to keep that service. But if there is value, then we probably need to do, uh, again, our homework just to uh, go back with you to understand what are the areas of dissatisfaction. But I take your point more, more than, uh, more than as important for me. Um, and again, m more generally in India, um, this is a growing country for us, and we're investing a lot here for the long term. I might just say one point on intercontinental activities, because this is here something that is happening a lot, uh, notably with China, but also other countries, and we're seeing only cardboard. So to your point, um, uh, I think that reusable packaging has its part to play, um, and, and again, we're more than happy to share, but sometimes the change dynamics uh, requires a, a long-term investment. Hope that I'll answer your different questions. You're welcome. Okay, thank, thank you for that. Uh, thank you for the honest question and, and the honest response there. Um, any, any last questions? I think we probably have time for one more question before we, we go to break. Uh, it can, it'll come for me then, because I, I kind of wanted to just ask Chris a little bit about, I mean, given that there's a lot of creativity that goes into concepts like you know, Dugard that you mentioned, some of them uh, can be positive, but perhaps some of them need to be addressed and not become permanent, uh, lest they become inefficient or dangerous or, or safety or inefficient issues. So how do you kind of address that uh, in India for UTI? Yeah, yeah there's, uh, in all the participants here have, uh, have echoed this. I mean, uh, in India for us is a huge growth engine, uh, very large focus for us. Um, and w one of the initiatives that um, UTI has developed uh, over the last year, uh, we, we call it um, um, mature solutions in emerging markets. And what, what we're trying to do is take some of the best practices that we've uh, developed in other parts of, of the world and then replicate those uh, to, to areas that, uh, that are in the, the developing world or seeing huge growth. Um, and so, uh, but also, we're, we're not uh, taking the approach that, uh, uh, you know, things are good or bad. It's really, um, at the end, what, what approach uh, is most effective and what approach is most sustainable. In some markets for us, uh, we can have a very automated IT-driven solution 
Um, and, uh, and then we can have something uh, like the 100-year flood in Chennai occur, where um, really uh, that could totally shut, uh, shut an operation down. So w what we're finding is there's a, a mix or a balance between um, approaches. Um, certainly, um, uh, do, do we want to replicate all of the jugads or all the workarounds and call those best practices and, and replicate those? Ma maybe not. But at the same time, um, we have to realize that uh, maybe in some cases, uh, that solution uh, works fine. And there's no need to, to rip it out if it's actually doing, uh, doing the job that it's intended to do. Hmm. So I had, a, I had one comment, uh, I if I could. I, I was really interested about the concept of culture. Uh, so Rajesh put up a slide, and I thought it was an excellent slide. And I wrote down a note about uh, culture being learned behavior. And, uh, and uh, Jay Paul, the gentleman from Harley, also mentioned that. At, from a provider standpoint, we see very intimately or very closely the providers that actually don't just preach lean, but actually are living it because it shows in your behavior to us. Uh, it shows in the questions that you ask us. And uh, the providers that where that has really been inculcated into your operating system and your culture, uh, we, we see that. And in fact, uh, I think there's a great opportunity for, uh, uh, for providers to um, uh, kind of cross-pollinate. So, we, we like when we're challenged on, hey, is this the, the most lean or most effective uh, solution? Can you, can you get a more cost-effective solution? Or why, why do you have to dis dispatch uh, two trucks? Can't you do one truck? I mean, those kind of sound like annoying questions, but just like uh, L Laurent said, we're here to serve you. We're here to serve the client. And, uh, and if we can't make you happy, uh, you, you'll definitely go elsewhere. So. But I think the cultural comment was really very interesting that was made before. Okay, thank you. I think that's a very good note to probably wrap up the session with. Um, maybe just a quick just remind. Just Christoph, if I, oh, if sorry, I, long. sorry to interrupt you. Yeah. But here, what Chris was saying is, is it's a global industry. So the, the one challenging point I have is that what you see in India is, is no different from what you see elsewhere. You know, it's not like, you know, um, I hear a lot when I travel saying, yeah, but you know, here it's specific. Well, you know what? I, uh, the more I travel, the less I see the specificities in our industry. And um, I think today is, is also there's a lot that, uh, um, you know, we can share in terms of best practices and benchmarks across the globe because we do work with 90% uh, of the industry globally. And, and we see even between countries differences within the same customer. And, and, and we do share also these approach with them so that we, we customizing a solution, but in general, we, we land on the same solution almost everywhere, which is, I think, uh, an, an interesting point, specifically when it comes to standardization of, of crates or when it comes to inserts. Uh, there's no such thing as your fuel injectors that look like fuel injectors elsewhere on the globe. So I think there are lots of habits. Uh, but, but also listening skills, as you was mentioning here, so that we can cross-fertilize what we see elsewhere. So, sorry to have interrupted No, not you. at all, not at all. Uh, it's worth being interrupted sometimes. But um, I, it's, a good, it's a good point, and, and you know, I think we, we can get caught up sometimes in overemphasizing the differences between places, some of the challenges that were mentioned, um, whether it's sort of not tracking properly one part of the supply chain or, or transport that kind of goes missing in, in systems, that is not an India only problem or, or, or boxes and packaging that goes missing, for example, and needs control. It's not an India only problem. You can hear that in Germany, in, in, in Detroit, in, in Mexico, anywhere. Uh, so we come together in those reasons in part to share this, the common solutions as well that, that can be found elsewhere. On that note, I also just wanted to highlight, because Chris obviously talked about roundtables, and, and that is something that we're doing tomorrow, I think tomorrow in the afternoon after lunch. Uh, we call them think tanks, and we're going to break you up into uh, smallish groups to, to discuss specific topics which are led by moderators. So it's just something to, to keep in mind for tomorrow as a chance to, to talk about some of these issues a bit more intimately. Uh, but I, did, I would like to thank our, our panelists again, and thank you all for your questions. Uh, and then you can join us for some coffee before our last session of the day.